Welcome to Hastings Mystery Theater. I'm your host and mystery master, Randall Schaefer. Tonight, the corridors of mystery take us to 1934 for a Chesterfield production, Green Eyes. A millionaire hosts a costume party and is soon found murdered. The police suspect his granddaughter. They had quarreled and the deceased intended to cut her out of his will. The accused granddaughter is played by Shirley Gray. She was born in Connecticut in 1902. She always wanted to be an actress and appeared on stage at age 18 and she made her first movie at age 29. She made 45 films in five years. She was very prolific. But other parts of her life were difficult. She had three failed marriages and when her son died she quit show business and turned into a recluse. She lived out her life with her sisters until her death in 1981 at age 79. Our male lead is Charles Starrett. His life was as charmed as Shirley Gray's was difficult. He was born to a wealthy New England family in 1903. He played football at Dartmouth, and the team had a few scenes in a football movie, and Charles Starrett caught the acting bug. His good looks, his muscular, athletic build assured quick success in Hollywood. In 1935, Columbia Studios needed a younger actor to replace their aging Western star, Tim McCoy, and Charles Starrett became the studio's new Western star. In 1940, he made the movie The Durango Kid, and the audience loved that character so much that Columbia made 65 Durango Kid movies in the next 11 years. He retired when the series ended. He was only 48 years old. He was filthy rich. He died in 1986 at age 82. Let's return to 1934. Enjoy Green Eyes. Take the horse that would be in the middle of things when we are masked and still playing hide and go seek. Yeah, oh, you better hurry or they'll find out we're gonna come after us. Gone. Do you think they'll follow us? They can't. I cut the ignition wires on all the cars. Well, what if they should telephone ahead? I cut the phone wires, too. Oh, I'm beginning to get scared. Now, don't worry. Plain murder. Three knife wounds in his back. Better call the police, Lennox. Yes, sir. Come on, Come on you all better out. get out of here. You can't do any good. Oh, Let's go. Is that you, Chief? Get this. Stephen Chester's been murdered. What? Take that piece of cabbage out of your mouth and talk so I can understand you. 
I said Stephen Chester's been murdered. I don't know. The phone wires were cut. Servants went over to neighbor's house to phone. Yeah. His granddaughter beat it away with a guest right after it happened. Yes, yes, we did. Sent out a broadcast to be picked up any minute now. This might be them coming out. Get your gun ready in case they get caught. Come on, move over, buddy. I'll drive. What's the idea? I was only doing 50. Oh, please, mister, let us go. We'll pay the fine. We're in a terrible hurry. Now, cut the comedy, sister. You're Jean Kester, aren't you? Oh, well, yes. Just as I thought. But you're going right back home. Come on, move over. What are you taking us there for? You know as well as I do. You're wanted for the murder of Stephen Kester. A list of the people who are at the party. They've all gone home now. I figured we'd have our hands full with the house guests and servants tonight. Say, if it wasn't that granddaughter of his or a sweetie, I'm a pelican. There are times when you resemble that noble bird more than you do a detective. Oh, so you got him, huh? Thanks a lot. Oh, Chance. Yes, sir. Take the two of them in there and see that they don't make another getaway. I'm going upstairs to the doctor, see if he's finished. Come on. After all, death isn't so terrible to the one it strikes. It's those who live on, safe and protected in body, but troubled in spirit who suffer. Don't you think? Uh, he was wearing this thing when we found him. He lives to be about 70 and then decides he wants to be a Chinaman. Who are you? Well, I paid ten dollars this morning to be a yodeler. What's your name? Tracy. Which Tracy? Michael Tracy. A novelist? Well, I'm not exactly a novelist. I write detective stories. Got a police record, haven't you? Yes, I've been arrested uh, seven or eight times. Four times for creating a disturbance while under the influence of alcohol. Three times for socking a cop on the nose and once, once for murder. I was exonerated from that, though. You see, I only commit murder with pen and ink. What are you doing here? Well, I'm a friend of Miss Kester's. I'm spending the weekend here. I've been doing a little sleuthing on the side since the murder, I suppose. Well, I've been keeping my eyes open. Well, we don't want anybody gumming things up, so don't figure to help us out. Well, I know a few things you might like to hear, but I'll try to keep them quiet. You'll get a chance to spill it when the time comes. He's been dead about three or four hours. Three wounds in the back from a double-edged knife. We've looked everywhere for that knife, but it just ain't here. Well, maybe the guy that did it's a sword swallow. I'm going to start throwing some questions. You stay here and let me know what the fingerprint men find. What's your connection here? Well, I'm, or rather I was, Mr. Kester's private secretary. Say, a guy who thinks up mystery stories could have thought up this one, too. Probably. However, the victim was suffering from angina pectoris. He would have died anyway before long if he hadn't been killed. Sure. I guess somebody got tired of waiting. Or maybe he was mixed up with a... Ah, he's too old for that. Where's the girl? Miss Kester was very upset. What with hearing about her grandfather and being hauled around like a common murderess, she went to her room with her maid. Meyer's watching her. All right, sit down, everybody. Take it easy. 
Supposing you tell me about the last time you saw Mr. Kester alive. I know all about how he was found. Well, Mr. Kester was having difficulty putting on the paper mache head, so I helped him. Then I came downstairs. Miss Kester had asked me to have the orchestra give her all of the drums at the end of the third dance as a signal for everyone to unmask. Did he come down and join the guests? Yes, sir. Where were you during the third dance? I was standing at the foot of the stairs talking to Mr. Hall. Did you see Mr. Kester? Yes, I did. He went up the stairs about the beginning of the third dance. Was this gentleman with you? No, no. He joined me a minute or so later. And you were there all during the last dance? No. No, we watched the dancers for a few minutes and then I went upstairs. You followed Kester? No. I just went upstairs. And then what? I went to my room. What were you doing there? I, uh, I was smoking. Couldn't you smoke downstairs? Yes, I could, but it was noisy and I preferred the quiet. How long did you remain in your room? Until I heard the scream. That was a funny remark you made when you walked into the bedroom and saw Mr. Kester had been murdered. What did he say? Well, I'll be doggone. I don't know what Emily Post would have said, but it didn't sound like the proper remark to make on seeing a body. What did you mean by that? I don't exactly know. Uh, just surprise, I guess. Were you a friend of Mr. Kester's? I knew him years ago in Mexico. He owned some mines and came to see them. How did you happen to be here tonight? I came to see him on business a few days ago, and he asked me to stay over the weekend. Where were you during the third dance? Sorry, I don't remember a thing. Oh, you don't, huh? No, I was practically unconscious all the time. Drunk? But not the way you think. I was intoxicated with a beautiful gypsy girl. Hemp the idea who she was, but we were getting along swell till some French marquee cut in on us. Well, then I wandered around looking for another partner. <laughs> Young man, I suppose you know that your actions tonight have been mighty suspicious. Are you accusing me of murder? I'm not accusing anybody. I'm simply trying to find out who had the motive and the opportunity to do it. Now you come right down off your high horse and answer my question civilly. Now where were you when it happened? Well, I can't very well say because I don't know when it happened. Where were you during the third dance? I was out on the ground, smoking. By yourself? Yes, until I grew tired of smoking. Then I walked back to the veranda and met Miss Kester. She told me she had a headache and asked me to take her for a ride. Then we both got in her car. Did you have any trouble starting it? Yes. Someone had cut the distributor wires. I put them together again and we left just as they were unmasking. You and the young lady you're engaged to don't seem to care much for dancing, do you? I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not engaged. I'm talking about Miss Kester and you know it. Oh, <laughs> I know. Everyone seems to. Well, that's all I'm going to ask you tonight, but I want to see all of you in the morning. Oh, Mr. Croft, I don't think you'll find Miss Kester and Mr. Miller are murderers. There's something much worse. What do you mean, worse than murderers? They're neckers. Really, young people nowadays are something terrible. Young man, if you have anything valuable to offer to this investigation, I shall be glad to get it. Otherwise, don't butt in. Oh, but it is valuable. I suspect them of being in love. According to my own private computation, I've discovered them together 14 times lately. Seven times embracing, seven times fighting like cats and dogs. Therefore, they must be in love. Maybe they were trying to elope. I'll bet that's just what they were doing. Now, how did you happen to figure that out? Well, I got an inkling yesterday when I asked Jean to marry me. And she said she couldn't because she already had a date to elope with Mr. Miller this evening. Well, he'd better not ask me because I won't tell him anything. Richard, Mr. Crofton. How do you do? How do you do? Just what is it that you're not going to tell? Nothing that would interest you. Everything interests me. Mr. Kester was seen going up the stairs at the beginning of the third dance. After it was over, he was found murdered. Now, just what were you doing during that time? I was dancing. All the time? Come on, you might as well tell me. I'll find out sooner or later. Well, no, I wasn't. I mean... Uh, well, what do you mean? I mean that once during the dance, I did go upstairs for a minute. What for? It's too bad a lady can't go to her own room for 
Mrs. Pritchard, how long were you in your room? Only two or three minutes. Anyone upstairs at that time? I didn't see anyone. Notice anyone in Kester's room? No, the door was closed, I think. You sure you didn't see anyone? I tell you, I didn't see anyone upstairs. I don't believe it. Do you mean to tell me I'm lying? Yes. <laughs> you saw someone upstairs, and you're going to tell me who it was. But I tell you, I didn't. I didn't. Don't lie. Because it'll only be all the harder for you. But I tell you... Who was it? All right. I'll tell. And you did see someone upstairs. What were they doing? Well, I, I opened the door to our room and started out. Then I remembered I'd forgotten to turn out the light in the bathroom, so I went back. And just as I stepped into the hall, I saw someone coming out of Mr. Kester's room. And who was it? Come on. It was Jean Kester. During the last dance before the unmasking, where were you? I was in my room. Why? I was tired and wanted to rest. How long did you remain in your room? Oh, during that dance. I had a little headache. I felt some fresh air would do me some good. So I went downstairs and asked one of the guests to take me for a ride. Mr. Miller's a pretty good friend of yours, isn't he? Oh, good enough. I understand you were engaged. Oh, yes. That's what everyone thinks. But there's not any truth in it. How come you took a notion to take a ride when you did? I should think, being hostess, that you would have stayed, just out of politeness. Should you? That's not answering my question. Well, then don't ask such absurd ones. If I felt like going for a ride instead of being polite, that's my affair. Maybe it was your affair, but it's mine now. Your grandfather was murdered, and it's my business to find out who did it. What were you doing in his room before you took the ride? I wasn't in his room tonight. You would swear to that? Of course I'd swear to it. You don't think that I killed him? No. But I think you know who did. Well, I don't. Can I go to her now? I want to ask you a few questions first. Where were you during most of the evening? I went upstairs when the dancing begun, having gotten things started satisfactorily in the kitchen, and having told Lennox, he's the butler, to look after the guests. That was my privilege to tell him. You know, I haven't been with the Kesters for 27 years, and him only 20. I went straight to Jean's room, started picking up, and I've been there ever since. Were you alone all that time? No, sir. Who was with you? Jean, for a short time. How long? Well, they'd been two dances. I could tell by the music. Jean came upstairs and said she was tired and wanted to rest a while. I said maybe a little fresh air would do her good. She said she'd hunt up Mr. Miller and ask him to take her for a ride. She went downstairs and I went on with my sewing. When did Miss Kester leave her room? A few minutes before all the screaming and running around out there when they found the body. And then she went directly downstairs? Yes, sir. How do you know? I watched her. You mean your door was open? No, sir. You don't catch me sitting around in no room with the door open. It's bad luck. But when she left, I went to the door with her and watched her go downstairs. Just one more question. Is Miss Kester engaged to Mr. Miller? Land sakes, no. A lot of people think so. But there's nothing to it. They're just good friends. Thank you. That'll be all for now. I wonder if you were struck with the same thing I was. What was that? The similarity of Miss Kester's, Miller's, and Dora's story. Yes, I got that. They seem to check all right. Well, just a bit too all right, don't you think? What do you mean? Well, they answered that engagement question the same way. Statistics prove that you can't get three honest observers to tell the same story. It's psychology. Proving that psychology can go wrong. No proving prearranged agreement. I don't think Miss Kester was in that old guy's bedroom at all. Neither do I. You think Mrs. Pritchard was lying? Sure. She pretended she didn't want to tell, but she only did it. Bad acting. Captain, Mrs. Pritchard wasn't lying. Jean was. How did you get smart enough to figure that out? Well, I saw myself. Were you upstairs during that dance? 
Yes, I happened to go up to my room. Well, you see, I needed a safety pin to retain my decency. And while I was there, I saw Jean come out of her grandfather's room. What else? Well, she seemed upset and in a hurry. I didn't see Dora, but that proves they're lying, doesn't it? Did you see Mrs. Pritchard? No, but I don't see how she missed seeing me. If she did, I, I'll have to thank her for keeping her mouth shut. Why are you so interested in pinning the murder on her all of a sudden? Well, I'm the disappointed lover. And in any good old Victorian novel, that's motive enough for committing a murder, isn't it? No, not in this case. That's no reason for croaking the old gent. Could be. He might have favored Miller and disapproved of me. Well, did he? Yes. You're the biggest fool I have ever seen. Well, when it comes to a choice between my neck and the ladies, it's just too bad for the lady. You couldn't be mixing up in this case just to get material for a novel, could you? I might be. Well, watch out you don't get into trouble. You're not above suspicion, you know. I'd like to talk to you. Where were you this evening during the dancing? After the music started, I went upstairs to pick up Mr. Kester's things and turn down the bed. Then I went down the back stairs and was busy in the kitchen until I heard the scream. Did you uh, see anyone in the hall? No, sir. What kind of a man was Mr. Kester to work for? He was a Simon Legree, sir. It's been most difficult to put up with him these past 20 years. You'll pardon my saying it, sir, but there's no one who won't be glad that he's gone. Did you have any quarrel with him lately? No, sir. I never argued. I, I just kept my feelings to myself, sir. Do you know of uh, anyone that did have a quarrel with Mr. Kester? Yes, sir. Who? Mr. Hall, sir. What kind of a quarrel? Well, Mr. Tracy was there at the time. Perhaps he could tell you more about it than I could. All right. Now is the chance for you to say something important. I happened to be downstairs the day he arrived. He refused to give his name to Lennox or state his business. Kester asked him to come in. As Hall started toward the study, Jean came downstairs. When they both saw each other, they stopped cold. That right, Lennox? They did, sir. He stepped closer to her as though he intended speaking to her. But she just stared. Then he turned away and I let him in the study. As I closed the door after him, I heard them almost immediately go into an argument. What about? I don't know, sir. I never eavesdrop. Did you happen to hear what they were arguing about? No, but they were both caught under the collar. I asked Jean if she knew him. She said she'd never seen him before in her life. Then Kester came out with Hall and introduced him. Said he was an old friend and was going to stay here a few days. Hmm. Any other quarrels that you know about? Yes, sir. The one he had with his granddaughter, sir. What was that about? I wasn't there, sir, but Mr. Pritchard was. You tell Pritchard I want to see him. Yes, sir. Did you notice that he never dropped the did you ring, sir, attitude all through the hubbub? Well, what of it? Well, I'm never satisfied with a murder unless it involves an old family retainer. They always know about the household skeleton. Well, I'm not interested in your theories. This is no book murder. Well, what did your men find out? The ignition wires and the distributor wires are cut on all the cars except the one Miller drove away in. And the ignition wires are cut on that. And the telephone wires are cut twice. Meaning what? Well, I'm trying to figure it out. In the meantime, we're looking for shoes. Shoes? Yeah, where the wires were cut on the Kester's bedroom, there's an impression of a heel. We've made a cast of that. You want to see me? Oh, yes. I understand that Miss Kester and her grandfather had a quarrel yesterday. What do you know about it? Well, Mr. Kester rang for me, and as I was going down the hall, I heard the sound of their voices. Come in. You gave Lennox orders to prepare the room so they could stay, didn't you? Certainly I didn't. I do it again. I'm the one to give orders house. Well, they're my friends, and if they want to stay, they'll stay or I leave with them. All right. As long as they're here, they can stay. But they'll not come here again. And why not? Because I won't have trash like they are Malik huddling around you. They play up to you, make love to you, and you let them. Of course. 
course I do. I'm human. They've asked you to marry them. Both of them, haven't they? And why? Because they want to get their fingers on your money. Well, they'll not get one cent. Do not marry either one of them. I'll marry whom I please. When the time comes for you to marry, I have a list of eligible men that will call on you. I suppose you think you can tell me when and whom I should marry, and that I'm to have a boy and he's to be named after you. Rot. Do you think you can arrange my life for me? Have you forgotten what you did to my mother? You leave her name out of this. Oh, you're ashamed to talk about that. You ruined her married life, and you killed her just as sure as if you stuck a knife in her heart. But you can't do that to me. We'll talk no more about that now. I'll see these men, both of them, after the party. And I'll buy them off. That's all they're after. Richard? Yes, sir. You are to pay up all charge accounts of Miss Kester's and close them up. I'll not be responsible for any more of her debts. Yes, sir. Do you think you can bully me by stopping my money? You forget I have some jewels left. You pawned some of them already, haven't you? Well, of course I have. You stopped my allowance about six weeks ago. How do you think I got my spending money? When you come to your senses, your allowance will be waiting for you. Two hundred, four hundred, six hundred, eight hundred, ten hundred, twelve hundred. Rena to bring my will out tomorrow. I want to make some changes. Yes, sir. Also, take all the Arco mining stocks I have and sell them. I might have known you'd want to cut me out of your will. Well, go ahead and try it. Then I left. I sent the checks to close the charge account and delivered his message to Mr. Rayna. You know what the reference to her mother was about? Well, not exactly. Miss Jean's mother died when she was two or three. Her father also. I think they lived in Mexico. Then Mr. Kester brought her here. Since then, she's been at one school and another. For the last few years, I've been in Europe. Well, I guess we all better get a little sleep. Oh, uh, you get hold of that lawyer and the will the first thing in the morning. Yes, sir. Say. Do you suppose Hall being from Mexico fits into that story about Jean's mother? Oh, any fool could figure that out. We'll put that in your book. Rainer, have you a copy of the new will? Yes, sir. But it was never signed. In just what way does it differ from the old one? The residue of the estate, instead of going directly to his granddaughter, was to be held in trust by Mr. Hall, and then go to Miss Kester or her heirs on his death. Do you think the new will would hold up in court? I think it would, if I were to swear that it was his wish and intention to sign it as soon as it was made up. Do you know why he wanted to sell those mining stocks? I didn't bother about those things much. Mr. Kester dabbled in stocks, but uh, Pritchard took care of the details. Mr. Kester disinherited his granddaughter and was murdered before he had a chance to sign the new will. Do you know anything about the Arco mining stocks that he wanted to sell? Well, not much. Uh, the mine is somewhere in Mexico. Do you have a list of those stocks? Yes, sir. Where did he keep them? In a little black book. He generally kept that in the wall safe in his bedroom. Do you know the combination of that safe? No, sir. Who did? Uh, Mr. Rayner. And Miss Kester. She sometimes kept her jewels there. I'd like to have a look at the contents of that safe, Mr. Rayner. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Caught this bird sneaking down the back stairs with these shoes under his arm. Where were you going? I was going to ask one of the servants to have the heels straightened. Looks like the same round holes that were in the mold. Yes, Chief, same round holes. I'm not the only one that wears rubber heels.
You sit down over there and keep cool. I'll attend to you later. Have you got a key to this box? Uh, no, sir. Mr. Kester usually kept it in his pocket. I'll take a look among his things. Uh, never mind. The lid's been jimmy. I suppose this goes to Hall according to that will. You'd better take care of it. What I've got to do is to find the $1,200. Say, Regan, you go and search Miss Kester's room, and while you're about it, look for that double-edged knife. Yes, sir. Is this what you're looking for? What are you doing with that? Cutting open some of the pages in this book. May I have it? Sure, I detest knives. Ever since my uncle's, he, he was a banker, stabbed himself in the vestibule. We can do without your comedy. Okay. Where did you get this? On the roof outside Mr. Kessler's bedroom. I found it this morning. Did either of you ever see this knife before? Did you ever see it before? Yes, sir. Where? In the scabbard on Mr. Hall's dresser. Miss Kester, there are still some things that puzzle me about last night. You're sure that you were at no time during the evening in your grandfather's room? Oh, excuse me, but for some unknown reason, I wasn't able to sleep very well last night. You and your grandfather had an argument the day before yesterday, didn't you? Well, I didn't keep a carbon copy of my actions. But you don't have to strain your memory to know that he cut off your allowance for the last six weeks. And then he put the whole $1,200 in the safe. Yes, I remember that. Grandfather was very much annoyed at my extravagance. He was trying to cure me. Any other arguments between you lately? No. Then why did you deliberately go to that safe and take out the $1,200? Well, how dare you accuse me of that? Your fingerprints were found on the knob. Why did you take that money? But I didn't. I tell you, I didn't touch the safe. Lying won't get you anywhere. What were you doing in your grandfather's room last night, during that last dance? I won't have you badgering her like this. No, you won't. Well, who's asking you what you'll have or what you won't? You have no business torturing a defenseless girl who can't strike back. Poor young girl. She wasn't so defenseless last night that she could go to her grandfather's room and come her. Keep your shirt on, youngster. That won't get you anywhere. Go on. Sit down. Now listen, both of you. Cut out the melodrama. Can't get away with it in a murder investigation. Now suppose you both come clean and tell me what you were doing in your grandfather's room last night. Gene, remember what I said. Mr. Crofton, I apologize for what I did just now. You have every right to ask whatever you see fit. On the other hand, Miss Kester has an equal right to refuse to answer until she's before a grand jury. You know that I can hold her as a material witness and detain her in the county jail? Yes, and I'm also aware that she can be released under a writ of habeas corpus. Oh, so you know your law. Yes, I've been studying law. Yet you're hardly the one to speak for. Her. Supposing we let Miss Kester speak for herself. I have nothing to say. And there's only one thing left for me to do. Chance. Place Miss Kester under guard till I can take her down to Mineola. Come on. Not you. I want to ask you some questions. You'll find it useless. I refuse to answer anything you may ask me. Even before you know what it is? Even before I know what it is. Found it, Chief. In Miss Kester's room? No, I couldn't find a thing there. Her maid was acting suspicious, so I locked up and searched the room. Found it tucked in her knitting iron. All right, keep your eyes on these two. They're under arrest. For murder? No, as suspects. Oh, come on, you two. Nervous fools. Oh, I think they're just scared. Do you think? Well, I think I've got this case about sewed up. But I've got to get them before the grand jury before I can get anything more out of them. Well, before you make the arrest stick, you better investigate that. Mr. Hall seems to be in a hurry. Regan, chance! That Hall guy's trying to make a getaway over the fence. You get hold of him and bring him right back. You understood my orders that no one was to leave this place, didn't you? Yes. Then why did you try to make a getaway? 
I can hardly approve your choice of words. Answer my question. I was merely trying to catch the 227 for New York. What for? I had an engagement. Who with what for and where? I had an engagement with my lawyer, Mr. Bertram F. Howe. When? Tonight at 6 for dinner at his apartment. What for? The nature of my business is uh, purely personal. No, oh, in other words, it's none of my business, I suppose. If you prefer to put it that way. Well, I've had enough of that kind of talk today, and I'm tired of it. This yours? Yes. Then you admit it. Perhaps you'll admit falling along the roof outside of Kester's room. No, I didn't. It's been missing from my dresser for two days. Did you report that to anybody? No. Well, that's all now. Well, I checked up with that lawyer of yours. Don't you try to make a getaway again. Oh, well, Mr. Hall. Where did you get such an unusual knife as this? In Mexico. I want to speak to Mr. Bertram F. Howe. Never mind who it is, I want to talk to him. Oh, you know where he can be reached? Thank you. Hall's lying too. Howe's been up in Maine for a week. He's not expected back until tomorrow. Well, I think Hall took a long chance and missed. Oh, are you thinking again? It's mighty smart of him. <laughs> well, I suppose you know who killed Kester. Certainly I do, but I've got to prove it. Where's that lawyer and the secretary? Up in Kester's room, looking over his stuff. <laughs> Anything missing? Can't find anything out of the way regarding his investments. Of course, uh, I can't be sure till I get back to town and check his deposit box. You fellows were pretty close to Kester. Ever hear him mention Hall? I've never heard his name mentioned in the ten years I was associated with Mr. Kester. Just an idea of my own, of course, but on one or two occasions I heard Mr. Hall mention the Arco Mining Company, and Mr. Kester seemed well uncomfortable. Uh, Kester owned some of that stock, didn't he? He did until the day before yesterday. I sold the last of it for him. $14,000 worth. It's ended here in this little black book. Did Hall have any visitors since he's been here? No, sir. Make any phone calls? Not that I know of. Did he write any letters? Yes, sir, he did. A few days ago, he rang for me, handed me a letter, and asked me to have it sent registered special delivery. Did you notice who to? I did, sir. Seeing as how he wanted it registered, to a Mr. Howe, sir. Uh, did he say anything else? Well, he asked me if Miss Kester was up yet. I said no. Then he asked me to send Dora to him. And did you? Yes, sir. Hmm. First she lies for the girl, then she hides the money. And now she's in cahoots with this fellow Hall. When did Miss Kester give you that $1,200 to hide for? What $1,200? The $1,200 was found in your knitting ball. Come on. You know what I mean. I swear with the holy mother of... I haven't any idea how that $1,200 got in my knitting ball. I must say it's risky business to be playing tricks and hiding $1,200 in my knitting ball. Stop saying $1,200 in your knitting ball. Yes, sir. Do you know anything about this fellow Hall? He's a very fine gentleman. And very generous, too. And he the second maid was telling me he gave her a dollar. He said just because she was so pretty. But never a bit familiar. Just kind and generous. Ever hear Kester talk about him? Never a word. Did you ever see him before? Never set eyes on him. Then what did he want with you in his room yesterday? Lennox was allowing his room to be neglected. Only one washcloth and a broken curtain sash. And the dust was three inches thick. You should have seen it. Why did you tell me Miss Kester went directly downstairs when you knew she went to her grandfather's room? She didn't. I saw her go downstairs. Mrs. Pritchard told me she saw her come out of that room. If you want to believe her, go ahead. Five years I've known her, never a word of trust could I put in her. Thank you. She's grand. Tremendous. I'd take my hat off to if I had a hat on. She's a marvelous liar, if that's what you mean. It looks to me like a murder syndicate. Miss Kester, Miller, Hall, and Dora. All of them know something they're not telling. And their lies don't hang together. There's something I should have told you about a while ago, but he was such a decent fellow that I hated to believe it of him. What is it? This. 
I saw it fall out of Hall's pocket right after lunch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Blood? Of course it is. Or you'll find it's his own. I was walking around the house with Hall this morning, and he got a nosebleed. That guy hasn't got blood enough to get a nosebleed. I'm awfully sorry. Oh, you frightened me. I was on my way to the kitchen and saw the door open and thought it rather unusual. Yes, yes, two minds with but a single thought. You know, I too was hunting the icebox and I lost my way. It can't be down here. Suppose we look together. It's right over here. Hello, Glutton. Save some rice pudding for me. I was so famished I couldn't sleep. Cold mutton. I've been thinking of this all the evening. That's one dish I couldn't relish in a house of murder. Mm, this is what I like. Informality. Wouldn't the papers like to get a picture of us sitting around in our sleepers? Goodness knows what my husband would think. Please don't mention our meeting tonight. Even though it was accidental. Don't worry on my account, madam. <laughs> well, you uh, speak for yourself. Don't worry, I won't tell it. Human nature's a funny thing, isn't it? Here we are, all under suspicion for murder, sitting around eating. We must have clear consciences, or none at all. Your insinuation is unjustified, Mr. Tracy. 
My conscience is clear enough to resent that remark. Just exactly what do you know about this murder, Mr. Hall? Just as much as you do, Mr. Tracy. How do we know you didn't do it? Well, for one thing, I wasn't mentioned in his will. Come on. He never did me any dirt. I didn't want his money, and he hasn't anything on me. The only reason I might have had for killing him was that I didn't like him. He was a snob. It's a swell reason. Certainly, it's always a good reason for making away with anyone. Then I'm six feet tall, weigh 185 pounds, and belong to the Bombay Bicycle Club. Say, you're not throwing me off with a lot of that fresh gab. I was just thinking. What? I was just thinking somebody's liable to be bumped off any time now. How do you figure that? Well, when anybody starts suspecting the real murder, they're generally quietly bumped off. Yeah, that gives me an idea. Maybe my life won't be so peaceful now. What do you know? Did it ever strike you that it was Mrs. Pritchard who opened the closet door and found Kester? Yet her fingerprints were not on that doorknob. Say, boy, you got something there. And another thing. Mrs. Pritchard was on that second floor during the last dance. Yeah, and so were you. I've got another idea. Yep. Well, that little black book might tell a big story if it could only talk. Ah, you pain. You're always going in for little black books. Well, I told you somebody was going to get bumped off. <coughs> what was that? Don't know yet. Keep quiet. Where was it? Shut up, everybody. That was a shot. Sounded like it came from over there. Pritchard, wake up. Wake up, Pritchard. Come on, wake up. Uh, what's the matter? Wake up. Come on, wake up. What's happened? We heard what's a shot, and it sounded like it came from this room. Anyone been in here? Oh, where's my wife? How do I know? Who sleeps next door? Mr. Hall. his heart. Well, I'll be doggone. That's exactly the way Hall felt about it. What do you mean? Well, that's what he said when he looked at Kester. Say, I never did understand what he meant. We find the body in the bedroom. We left everything just as we found it last night. He probably knew we were closing in on him and took the easiest way out. But they've had a grudge against Kester for years. Oh, uh, pardon the interruption. But I don't think Hall killed Kester. And I don't think he committed suicide. All right, Smarty. Spill your theory. Well, I was just wondering. Why wasn't Pritchard awakened by that shot? And why wasn't his wife in the room with him? Maybe he was doped. Right. That's why I've been hanging on to these. And I think your chemist will find that someone's been hitting the junk. Tell the butler I want to see him and get me Pritchard. Right. seem to be able to keep awake. You had a glass of wine last night, didn't you? Uh, two glasses. 
The wine doesn't usually affect me like this. Two glasses? Yes, my wife didn't want hers, so I drank them both. When Lennox brought the wine up to the room, who took it? Let me see. Well, I think my wife did. What's that got to do with what happened last night? Oh, nothing, nothing. Just clearing up a few odds and ends. This uh, suicide sort of settles things. That'll be all just now. Where was Mrs. Pritchard last night? Well, let me think. Uh, I don't know. I didn't take any nose for her until after everything was over. Oh, oh Dora. Yes, sir? You heard that shot, I presume? I did that. And I was never so scared in my whole life. Do you remember seeing Mrs. Pritchard come out into the hall? No, sir, I didn't. When I left my room, she was still there. I don't remember when she left. Your room? Yes, sir. What was she doing there? She was sleeping. She came in and woke me out of a sound sleep, saying as how nervous and scared she was and wanted to sleep on the day couch. Is she in the habit of doing that? Not in the five years that I've known her. But if you ask me, it's five years too long. Thank you. Oh, Captain, I realize you want me to stick around here until this business is over, but I'd like to go to town today, if you don't mind. Oh, I promise I'll be back this afternoon, and I couldn't get away if I wanted to. You all know me. You know where he was last night when the shot was fired? Yeah, he was with me. All right, then, you can go. Thanks. But listen, no funny business. Put a tail on that guy. I sure would like to pin something on him. Now, don't tell me you saved enough money to buy Arco mining stock. No, no. Tell me what you know about this company. Well, the Arco mine is in Mexico. It was developed under a partnership between Stephen Kester and a fellow named Roger Hall. And back in 1914, Kester froze the other fellow out, unloaded his stock, washed the prices down, and left Hall holding the stack. Since that time, he's bought a lot of that stock back, and now it's one of the most valuable stocks on the market. How much stock did Kester hold? Well, you'll have to see the bank he did business with to find that out. All right, all right. Suppose you use your influence with that banker and call him up and have him have all the information when I get there. I'm in a hurry. He had $111,000 worth two days before he was murdered. $111,000? Mm-hmm. Thanks. In my opinion, the original figure was 111,000. The first one has been incorporated into a dollar sign, and the cross on the four has been added with an ink of a different chemical basis. Could have been done easy, couldn't it? Thanks. Well, here I am again. Where's everybody? In there. Then uh, Mr. Hall didn't have a dinner engagement with you last night? No, he did not. You've heard from him lately, though? I received the letter which you have there. Dear Bert, enclosed find a letter which you will keep with the rest of my stuff for delivery after I'm dead. It won't be long now, which isn't such a joke as you might think. I won't be seeing you again soon. Roger. You knew uh, Hall pretty well, didn't you? Yes, I've been his friend for a number of years. I'm the executor of his estate, whatever it is. Go and get Miss Kester for me. You can tell by the way they're acting, they don't think it's a suicide. Cliff, it's no use. We can't go on. We've got to tell them. Gene, now do as I say. You've got to keep your mouth shut. It's our only chance. You don't know the police like I do. Come on, Romeo and Juliet. 
The chief wants to see you. Come on. Mr. Howe brought me a letter to you from Mr. Hall. Well, I don't understand. Why should he write me a letter? It was to be delivered to you after his death. I'd like you to read it. Do you mind if I read it aloud? No, go ahead. Dear Jean, once upon a time, many years ago, I amused you for hours by crawling on all fours back. Now you know the other afternoon was not our first meeting. Small wonder, then, I may have appeared to you like some strangely remembered ghost from the past. That past reaches back to when I was a mining engineer in a project with your grandfather. It was then I met your mother. I shall not try to tell you my feelings for her. I shall only tell you that I loved her more than all the world. Shall I go on? Yes. My case was quite hopeless from the start. She had already fallen in love with another man, your father, a charming, delightful man. Your grandfather forbade your mother to marry him. So straightway, she packed up her things, met Pete, married him, and went to live in the little college town where he was teaching. I was the only guest at their wedding in the city hall. Shortly after that, I went back to the mines and for two years, I was up to my neck in work. And then I got a letter from Sylvia announcing the birth of her daughter. Soon after that, a second letter came. Your father had died of incipient tuberculosis. What little money there was, was eaten up by doctor's bills. Was there any kind of a job she could do? I wired her the money, and immediately she arrived with her baby. You were very red and squalling, and the first time I tried to kiss you, you socked me in the eye for the fresh guy that I was. Sylvia took a job in the mine office, helping with the bookkeeping, doing clerical work, and writing some letters for me. What a come down from the luxury of your grandfather's home. She got up at six, prepared your bottles for the day, bathed you, and took you to your daily parking place. Then she worked in the office until six at night. I begged her to write her father. She refused, so I did, and told him how much she needed help. Soon after that, the Arco mine steadily declined. We were short-handed, and the strain on Sylvia was ghastly. You alone thrived, grew fat, and then one night, your mother died. She was murdered, murdered by her own father, just as surely as if he had shot her with a gun. He murdered her, and so help me, I'm going to murder him. But I'm getting ahead of myself. You were left behind, and what a puzzle you were. I thought for a while I would keep you for my own, but I soon realized the folly of that. So again, I wrote your grandfather. Then Dora arrived. I didn't feel so badly parting with you when I knew she was to be your nurse. I've had my hands full the last few days to keep her from telling who I am. After all these years, I found myself back in New York. I couldn't resist the temptation to take one more look at you before I died. I blackmailed your grandfather into inviting me to stay here for a week. So here I am, and I've seen many things. Jean in love with a poor young man, and Kester making their love affair bitter and furtive. But you, my dear, are not the woman your mother was. You couldn't stand up under the poverty and worry and work as she did. And so for the sake of Sylvia, whom I loved, and for charming Peter, and for the baby who socked me in the eye, I'm going to solve your problems for you. It's a very simple solution. Two bullets. One for Kester, and one for myself. Just when I shall do it, I haven't decided yet. I can see too plainly the smoldering, maddening frustration that your Cliff is trying so hard to keep in check. I don't want him to beat me to the pleasure of murdering Stephen Kester. Lovingly, Roger Hall. That isn't true, that part about Cliff. The rest of it is every word of it. He killed my mother and I hate him, but that isn't true about Cliff. No, I know what he meant when he looked at Kester and said, well, I'll be doggone. It was just pure surprise. No wonder he was surprised. 
someone did beat him to it. Oh, why don't you let us alone? Why don't you stop digging into this? Paul admitted that he killed my grandfather and then committed suicide? Yes, he did. And that's just what we're going to do. Let it stand as it is. Oh, yes, the captain's been assuring the newspapers every day that they can expect an arrest at any moment. But, you know, the captain, he has to have his little joke. <laughs> I can't understand all the movements of the detectives. Well, just at present, they're more concerned with certain aspects of his life than the actual manner of his death. Well, I'm sure they can find nothing but good in his life. Smoke? Well, thanks. You know, we've been going through his notebook. And we found some items that are rather puzzling. But I thought he kept everything in his private book quite clear. What are those? Marbles. Or maybe glass eyes. I got them from Mr. Hall. He told me rather an interesting story about them. Did you ever see them before? Why, no. Pritchett, just why was it necessary for you to change certain figures in Mr. Kester's notebook? I don't know what you're talking about. That's too bad, but the advantage is mine. I happen to know what I'm talking about, and I know you know what I'm talking about. Why, you sit down. It was a difference of $97,000 worth of stock. I suppose you know nothing about that. I certainly not. Just how does it happen that you're able to afford an expensive apartment on the salary you receive here? And how were you able to buy a $3,000 car and store it in a garage? And how did you manage to send your wife on an expensive trip to Europe last year? And what about those losses in stock speculations? What I'm getting at is this. You took Kester's stock to cover yourself. You can't deny it, can you? No. Well, I guess you've caught me. It's a lucky thing for you Kester was killed before he found out what you were doing. But I didn't do that. I mean the murder. Oh, no? Of course not. How could I? I wasn't upstairs during that last dance. But your wife was. But she wasn't in that room. She told you that. It was Miss Kester. My wife saw Miss Kester come out of that room. Yes, but your wife didn't tell us what she did when Miss Kester came downstairs. It's just possible she might have gone in there and... You're lying! You're lying and you know it. You know I didn't go into that room. How should I know? Because I saw you up there in the hall. I saw you come out of your room and follow Miss Kester over to the top of the stairs. You were up there at the time he was murdered. Why didn't you tell the detectives that? You got me there, sister. Maybe you won't be so ready to accuse other people now. Crockton. Listen. You guys haven't discovered anything yet. You've been running around in circles. Do you want to hear some news? Do you think you can tell us anything we don't know already? Yes. There's going to be another murder around here pretty soon. And I have a sneaking suspicion I'm slated to be the victim. Oh, and I suppose you want me to detail about 20 men to guard that pretty body of yours, That's huh? just what I don't want. But I want you to take all your men outside tonight. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Do you know any more? Oh, you can throw a corner of the whole department on the outside, but keep these halls clear. And I'll promise to be responsible. For your own murder? Sure. I won't close my eyes all night. Go on, let him get bumped off. Be one less guy to suspect. Well, it isn't going to do any harm to watch things from the outside. I don't know. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to play marble. when you won't be able to wipe those fingerprints off. What fingerprints? The ones on the gun that Hall was supposed to have used. It's just funny, but he couldn't wipe those fingerprints off after shooting himself. No, you can't pin that on me. Well, I'm not trying to. 
It's strange, Pritchard, but there was no odor of wine on your breath after you were so hard to wake up. Now take a look over there. You made your first mistake when you bought two Chinese outfits from the same place. You made your second mistake when you threw one in the incinerator and tried to burn it. You forgot the eyes wouldn't burn, didn't you? Yes. <clears throat> now I want to hear from her own lips. Just when you slipped that disguise off and showed up downstairs among the dancers. Come on, spill it. It was you down there among the guests, wasn't it? Yes. I thought so. I asked him a question and he rushed off without answering it. I thought it was funny at the time. Well, come on, spell it. Just how did you do it? I went upstairs, just like Hall testified. Only it was me instead of casting. And I slipped out of the outfit and threw it down the chute of the incinerator. I threw in a lighted matches and papers. Then I, then I went down the servant's stairs and showed myself in the hall. You killed Kester earlier in the evening and threw his body in the closet, didn't you? Yes. Yes, I did. Why? Do you know why? You told me why yourself this afternoon. You know what you'll get for it, don't you? Well, I know. But I don't care. It's better than this suspense. My wife made me do it. She ate, nagged, nagged, nagged me till I got myself in a hole I couldn't get out of any other way. I'm not to blame. She is. What are you going to do with me now? Nothing. Crofton and Regan will be here the first thing in the morning. You can go now. I said you could go now. Happened? Not a sound all night, sir. I might have known it was a lot of hot air. Oh, good morning, Captain. Nice morning. You look as though you were drawn through a knot hole. What happened? Nothing. That. It sounded as though it came from Mr. and Mrs. Pritchard's room. Well, I'll be doggone. Yeah, that's what Hall said. Listen, there's just one thing I want to know. You took that $1,200 out of the safe to get married on, didn't you? Yes. Could you get married without it? Sure. Well, go ahead. Preachers get up early and I'll fix everything with Crofton. Go on, go on, quick.
Well, did you like the movie? I hope so. Because me, my wife Judy, and production manager Dan LeClaire, we enjoy bringing you these old black and white murder mysteries from the 1930s and 40s. And if you enjoy seeing them as much as we enjoy presenting them, we invite you to join us every Thursday and Friday night at 7 p.m. and other times during the week as our schedule allows. You can see the best of them right here, black and white murder mysteries on Hastings Mystery Theater. Good evening.